Good morning, and welcome to this week's episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. I hope everyone is doing well today. My name is Katie Berg. I'm a research study coordinator with the Havey Institute, and I'll be leading today's discussion. I'd like to welcome and introduce Dr. Robert Murphy all the way from vacation. How are you doing, Rock Dr. Murphy? I'm, I'm doing okay. It's a nice afternoon, nice and sunny here. Awesome. Dr. Robert Murphy is the Executive Director of the Havey Institute for Global Health and the John Philip Fair Professor of Infectious Diseases here at Northwestern's Feinberg School of Medicine. He answers your COVID, infectious disease, and public health questions each week on the Havey Institute for Global Health's Facebook page. Today, Dr. Murphy will be addressing the latest headlines, our lone U.S. COVID statistic, and a suggest suggested topic from one of our viewers submitted through today, June 13th. We invite you to submit any suggested topics or questions you have down below via Facebook at NU Institute for Global Health or by email at globalhealthinstitute at northwestern.edu. Starting with our COVID statistic, average COVID deaths per day is at 34 daily. And in the same week, 2023, we saw 106. Dr. Murphy, your reaction to that number and the general status of COVID? Yeah, it's... um. <clears throat> A couple of things are going on right now. The numbers have not really changed very much. So we're in this 25 to 35 uh, person death per day. That's over 12,000 people per day, uh, per year, by the way. Um, that has not really changed. It seems to be the bottom. And the, the other thing that's going on right now is there appears to be some slight uptick in different parts of the country in cases which are not officially tracked anymore. However, some groups are monitoring emergency room visits, and that appears to be up in certain places like in Hawaii uh, and in places where they're looking. Um, but it's kind of sporadic, but it's a little disturbing that there, there could be a summer wave. Remember, COVID has not become a completely seasonable respiratory disease yet. It may never. Uh, we've had summer outbreaks before, and um, we'll see what happens. But um, right now, it's kind of stable, and uh, you know, we'll we'll just follow it the best we can. Mm -hmm. And I hear there's a new dominant variant. Not that the variant itself is new, but that it has kind of taken over the other variants around. Right. Yeah. So JN1 was the new variant from the Omicron family that came out uh, a couple months ago. And subvariants of that, KP2 and KP3, are the ones that are, are the predominant ones floating around now. What that means for us, they, they behave about the same um, that we can tell so far. Uh, the vaccine that will be developed in, in, for the fall, um, it's a question the, the um, FDA group uh, actually uh, had uh, recommended uh, making the vaccine against JN1, which is kind of the parent of these circulating KP2 and 3, uh, because that might have a little bit broader activity. But that has not been, I guess, officially decided yet with all parties. So we'll see what happens. But it's definitely going to be better than the old vaccine that people took uh, a year ago. Mm -hmm. We will keep an eye on that for any more official announcements. But that will lead us into our viewer-suggested topic for the day. We had a viewer write in and ask us to talk about some children's snacks that were found to have high lead levels. Can you tell us a little bit about these snacks and what they found? Well, um, this is uh, actually came up from Consumer Reports, actually. Um, and they found that in a variety of cassava and sorghum-based veggie snack foods, veggie puffs, from companies called like Lesser Evil and Serenity Kids, uh, Once Upon a Farm, all these kind of healthy sounding names actually were had quite a bit of lead in them. Um, and so, you know, that's disturbing. Uh, you know, there's it's still much less than uh, uh, little mini epidemics that they found in the past with the lead in it. But still, it's of concern. And it just means that, you know, all these foods have to really be uh, closely watched uh, because of there's just you know so much tox so many toxic uh, metals and chemicals uh, in the food that you know just looking at a package that says it's uh, you know lesser evil is you know not going to be you know really enough somebody has to actually test test for it I'm sure nobody's trying to do this but you know it's a uh, it is uh, you know it's an issue that has to be addressed and tested on a, on a regular basis. 
Mm -hmm. And just for clarification, some of those cassava based puffs, some of them were recommended in less than half the serving on the label by researchers at Consumer Reports. The sorghum based ones did a lot better than the cassava based, but still something to look out for. Yeah, there's a, it, you know, how much lead is good? Uh, probably none, but you know, you, you know, it's in the environment and mm -hmm. we're not going to be able to get to zero. Uh, and how much can your body really uh, take? Uh, it's not really, it, you're never going to get to zero, but mm -hmm. you know, small amounts can be tolerated. Mm -hmm. We will keep an eye out for any regulatory bodies that may comment about this. If not, we'll try to keep up with the news and keep you all informed on that. But for now, we're going to transition over to the avian flu, our biggest story over the past few months. There has been some huge news, not only regarding H5N1, but other strains around the world. Can you tell us about what's going on, you know, just over the border and also here in the U.S.? Yeah, so in the U.S., um, it, the situation is the same. Uh, there's only the two cases that, or three cases that were found in uh, dairy farm workers, uh, all three of them did well. They had H5N1. However, across the border in Mexico, there's a 59-year-old Mexican with underlying medical illnesses who had H5N2, uh, a variant of that. Uh, this person had no poultry contact and, uh, and passed away, unfortunately. Um, he had, as I mentioned, some underlying illnesses. Uh, in 2021, uh, there was an outbreak in China of H5N6. And in that outbreak, um, 18 people died. So this can be a very lethal disease. What, what the government has done, the Department of Health and Human Services, is they have stockpiled 4.8 million doses of the H5N1 vaccine that is already available. Uh, this is a cell-based vaccine. It's not made from eggs like other flu vaccines. Uh, and the primary target will be the uh, dairy workers. Um, there's 100 to 150,000 of them. Um, and, you know, we'll see, but at least, you know, people are, of course, still watching. There's still no evidence that H5N1 goes person to person yet. Mm -hmm. Something to keep an eye on and certainly lots of big news coming out on avian flu every week. So we will keep you up to date on that. But on the vaccine front, a different vaccine. Recently, GSK's RSV vaccine was approved and expanded for a new group. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so respiratory syncytial virus, RSV, uh, we've been talking about this quite a bit, is, is a nasty, another nasty respiratory virus. Uh, every year, young kids and, and elderly people are the primary targets of this thing. Um, typically in a year, 177,000 or so people get hospitalized and up to in last year, 14,000 people died uh, from it. Um, it, the first two vaccines were approved for people 60 and over, um, and but the Pfizer vaccine was also approved for pregnant women because if pregnant women give uh, get the vaccine, they will make the antibody that protects their, ch their child who's about to be born. So um, the other way you can do that is to, for kids under uh, eight months, is give them the monoclonal antibody, a, a drug uh, called Bayfortis. And, you know, there have been supply issues with Bayfortis, and they just haven't been able to get enough drug out there to treat every kid because it, it can be quite serious disease in kids under eight months. You look, when they have these outbreaks, the pediatric ICUs are full of respiratory syncytial virus or RSV infected babies. So, so pregnant women can get it. And then now uh, GSK is approved uh, for 50 years and up. Yeah, that is really great news. Hopefully that will take some of those hospitalizations and therefore fatalities down in the coming seasons. Right. But we had another study out of Stanford University that was around COVID, long COVID specifically, and they did not find the results they were looking for. Can you tell us what they were studying and what happened? Yeah, they, they looked at, um, uh, I think it's 155 people here with long COVID. Most of them had chronic fatigue, um, and uh, brain fog and or brain fog. Those were the most common symptoms. And they gave them a 15-day course of Paxlovid. That's the treatment for COVID, which works quite well, whether you're vaccinated or not. And it did basically did nothing. Uh, they had actually planned on enrolling 200. And it was, it was 
the results were so unremarkable that they stopped the study early just uh, for futility. It just uh, wasn't really doing anything. And this is actually not surprising because the long COVID is probably uh, some immunologic reaction um, that's triggered by the virus um, and not directly the virus itself. That's one of the theories anyway. Um, but 15 days was definitely not enough. Mm -hmm. We'll keep an eye out for any more Paxlovid studies relating to long COVID. The researchers also identified that perhaps because their uh, population of participants were highly, highly vaccinated against COVID, that could have had something to do with it. But we mm -hmm. really won't know until we see more research. Exactly. Yeah. Now, another small salmonella outbreak in the U.S. A few weeks ago, we were talking about backyard poultry. This one seems to have had a different cause. Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, so salmonella is not going away either. And there have been two little outbreaks uh, going on um, that uh, one of them um, involved cucumbers um, that were processed or distributed by a company in Florida. Uh, and that has spread to 25 states. Uh, cases, uh, and of those uh, people that got infected, 54 of them ended up in the hospital. Fortunately, nobody died from the disease. If you have a lot of underlying illnesses and you got it, I mean, it could be life-threatening, but in general, you know, if you get treated, uh, you're okay. The second outbreak, uh, they're not really sure uh, if it's really the same thing or just another kind of salmonella that's out there that's being investigated now. But it's just yet another thing that's out there that uh, we have to be uh, careful and monitor closely. Mm -hmm. Of course, you'll not always know when items have been recalled, but always a good idea to stay up to date on those recalls. Right. Now, our final story of the day, a little behind the scenes, accidentally got cut from one of our previous episodes due to my technical difficulties, but there was a huge, amazing breakthrough in regards to a global pandemic treaty. Can you tell us what the breakthrough was? Yeah, so the the it's all about pandemic preparedness and how all the countries are gonna work together if there's another pandemic. So, you know, right after COVID, you know, everyone said, oh, this is a great idea because we were so disorganized uh, during the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Um, so uh, there were some, you know, stops and starts uh, going with this, but they finally come to a, an agreement that everyone um, appears to be on board with. And it's, it's a very simple structure. Um, basically, they have agreed on a clear definition of what a pandemic is. All right, so let's let's start with the definition. Uh, they agree on the concepts of solidarity, everybody working together, and equity. You know that you know whatever benefits are out there are going to be shared, uh, and you know we're all in this thing together. So you know that's just a, a concept, but they agreed to that. And then the the final part of the treaty is to um, are, are ways to improve. Uh, collaboration and coordination between all the different partner states uh, and to figure some way to measure the effectiveness of all the interventions uh, and, uh, and other issues surrounding the, uh, the next pandemic. So effectiveness, coordination, solidarity, equity, and a clear definition is really all what the treaty is about. But, you know, it's just definitely a step in the right direction. And you know everybody wants the best, and the, as we found from COVID and from flu and from RSV and all these infections, they don't know any political borders. Uh, these things just spread. People travel so much. Uh, food and products are transported uh, globally now. You just don't know where anything is really from, and uh, that is just a setup, you know, for things spreading globally. So uh, it's it's a great step in the right direction. Absolutely. It will take global collaboration to fight a global pandemic or epidemic for sure, as we have seen in our own experience. Right. But on that note, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Murphy, for sharing your time and your expertise, especially out on vacation. We really appreciate it. <laughs> All right. I'll be back next week live. And 
Thank you all for joining us for another episode of Ask Dr. Murphy. If you have any questions or topics you'd like to see Dr. Murphy discuss or address, please put them down in the comments or email any of our social medias, excuse me, contact any of our social medias in the description, and we'll see you next week. Have a great weekend.